Today, we discuss the first vice presidential debate and if both VPs were able to defend their future bosses. Then, Israeli settlements continue to be built in the West Bank, though legal Palestinians still call upon complete withdrawal from their, quote, native land. And finally, Nevada's marijuana legalization ballot question leaves a lot of voters feeling worried and some feeling high. Four UNLV panelists are with us today to hash it all out. Thank you for joining us. This is The Scramble. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Our guests today are Spanish programming reporter Adania Ramirez, political science analyst Brendan Salawada, KUNV host Lee Guilford, and political, uh, political science analyst Blake Johnson. We begin on our first topic. On October 4th, Democratic vice presidential nominee Tim Kaine and Republican vice presidential nominee Mike Pence battled it out in, on the debate stage at Longwood University in Farmville, Virginia. First, let's look at how Tim Kaine measured up. Right out of the gate, debate moderator Elaine Quilano hit Kaine with the fact that Hillary Clinton is facing disturbingly low trustworthy favorability percentages at about 60 percent. Clinton was granted thanks by Tim Kaine for her efforts on the Iran deal. When facts show Hillary Clinton may have helped with the deal, she was not in office as Secretary of State when it was agreed upon. And finally, Debate analyst said Tim Kaine did a lot for Hillary's case, but his constant interruptions did no good for his personal political portfolio. All in all, how did Kaine do? Lee, I'm going to throw it to you. Tim Kaine, what do you think? I tell you what, out of everybody I've seen, including the two presidential and two vice presidential candidates, I think right now Tim Kaine is the most ready to lead this country. And it's a testament to his poise and his ability. I don't mind the interruption. I don't, I've never seen another record of him interrupting people like this, and I think this election has just devolved into the kind of spectacle where this has become accepted. I'm not exactly happy with the 70-plus interruptions, I think, is what we came up with or something like that. But I think overall, the points that he had to get in there and hit, he hit. And I don't dislike Hillary Clinton more after the debate, which is ultimately all the vice president is really supposed to do is not embarrass their future boss. I think with Mike Pence's performance... I tend to look at him and think he's the he's even maybe even worse than Trump in addressing issues in that he never actually regarded anything. I, I, I think Cain did exactly what he was supposed to do. He upheld Hillary's her image, I want to say. I use that word loosely, but he upheld her image and he did what a vice president should do is just like an umpire, a good umpire in a baseball game is when it's all said and done, you really want to forget about their presence there. And I think he did just enough that nothing jumped out at me that I want to harp on, and I'm really happy to see that he performed admirably there. Well, then the question I'm going to ask you then is, looking at the vice presidential debate and vice presidential debates in history, mm -hmm. not many end up moving the meter very much. Do you think that this moved the meter much for Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump, or do you think it really didn't make any sort of significant impact on the campaign? To be honest, in this election, I don't think there's anything he could have said other than Hillary Clinton is giving out a million dollars for every vote that would have moved the meter. This has to be the most polarizing election in history. So the, the allegations against both candidates that have been levied from both sides are so astronomical that in any other circumstance, we would have scrapped the candidates and started over. The fact that we've ridden with these candidates the entire time and been told this is what you get and deal with it is a testament to where politics have gone. So I don't think there's anything that either candidate could say at this point that would dissolve or sway anybody's view yeah, of the Yeah, I think that candidate. you can look just to that by looking at the viewership of the vice presidential debate versus the presidential debate. The presidential debate broke records, and I personally, from watching the vice presidential debate, have to say its entertainment value was a lot lower. It was a little boring, in yeah, my opinion. It was, it was more what a vice presidential, even a presidential debate yeah, should absolutely. look like. You know, politics, let's be honest, is not a very exciting arena, except when Donald Trump gets involved, <laughs> but it's, that's how it's, politics is supposed to be. So I, I appreciate that. I do, wanna, I do wanna disagree with one of your points about uh, the interruptions. That actually surprisingly bothered me a lot because it reminded me of Trump. It seemed almost childish and pettyish. And I, he made a lot of good points and I actually will say he came off a lot better than uh, what I originally thought of him. I wasn't a fan when uh, she first announced him. I thought it was a safe choice. And I remember the moment that really sold me for him was when he talked about his religion and he was grappling with it with the death penalty. And I thought that to me is an honest moment. That's what I want to see in a leader. And so that solidified me, uh, solidified him as a vice presidential uh, candidate to me. But the interrupting, that bothered me so much. Well, Brendan, I'm going to hold you to that and ask yeah. you a lot of political 
multiple spinners spun that the reason that Tim Kaine interrupted was so much is it was able he was making it so that Trump wasn't able to tell him or his campaign to say, well, look at this guy interrupting so much because Donald Trump himself yeah. interrupted so much during the first fight, uh, first presidential candidate mm -hmm. uh, debate. Yeah. So do you think that this, in a sense, disqualified Trump being able to criticize Tim Kaine because he himself falls in the same category? I mean, no, let's be honest, nothing's ever going to disqualify Trump. He's going to do what he wants, when he wants, however he wants. Well, let's hope so I, disqualifies I, him. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, I think it, it would evens the playing ground. I would just have to say, they don't need to stoop to that level. I love Hillary in the first debate because she didn't engage him. She let him be a child. She let him be a petulant little brat who did what he wanted and said what he wanted and didn't care. She didn't engage him, which made her look all the more presidential. And I think for Tim Kaine, who again, gave a really good performance, for him to do that, I think it kind of took away from that image, honestly. I, I tend to agree with you on the taking away from the image, but I like it. When we talk about yeah. on the fence and non-traditional politicians, yeah. a lot of the people that look at Donald Trump don't like his policy. They don't like Absolutely. the comments that he's made, but they like that he's willing to just stand up and act like a, a jock yeah. at, a, at a homecoming almost, there is, for I, lack of a better yeah. term. I, There's I something think, about that's, that that's yeah, yeah, I refreshing. Think that's, that's the problem problem though with um, with this election is that everyone's watching it for the show you know yeah. and at the end of the day they focus so much on the show that they take away from the actual content they take away from the actual policies yeah. they take away from yeah. the actual change that these presidents are supposed to create Absolutely. in this country if they do want to create a change yeah. you know so I think that the vice pre presidential debate, I think it was really good because yeah. they actually did not focus so much on the on the cattiness yeah. and they actually talked about the issues. Yeah. So I, I think watching the debate, I got to have an understanding of the stance of the, the presidential candidates yeah. a little bit more than just watching the presidential I debate. I, I want you to respond Blake, to that. There was a lot of content and I really liked that as well, especially um, policy wise. I mm -hmm. thought there was a lot of content and I thought they were pretty evenly matched as far as credentials goes they both have very similar backgrounds both have been married 31 years both of them have children in the military both of them have a lot of experience so it was evenly matched in that regard and I think we have to look at the, what the goals of each candidate were so for um, Clinton's vice presidential nominee Kane he needed to really work on humanizing their campaign and I think that, that was a big goal and with yeah. him interrupting and trying to be so candid that was his goal and I really don't think it played off well. I, I was agree. very Absolutely. impressed with Pence's and if you just put them head to head I felt Pence performed a lot better. He had a lot more poise. In fact if I may use I the word demeanor that. it might have <laughs> been a little bit better than Kane's. But um, what I didn't think that Pence did was do what he needed to do, which was back up Trump. Because every time oh, yeah, that right. the moderator would bring up something that uh, Trump had said or had done and asked uh, Pence to address it, Pence was amazing at skirting right around the question. He would just go right over it. <laughs> and he didn't really address any of those yeah. big things. So although I think Pence did a better job at debating than Kane, I think yeah. Trump was the loser I'm in the vice president. Well, well, well speak, speaking of Pence, I, speaking of Pence, let's move on to Mike Pence yeah. formally. Yeah. Pence's first mistake at the debate was thinking the wrong university, <laughs> <laughs> saying Norwood I'm instead sorry. of Longwood, which gave some locals second thought. Kane leveled at Pence the facts that Trump has called Mexicans rapists and criminals, called women slobs, pigs, dogs, and disgusting. He said an Indian-born federal judge is unqualified to hear federal lawsuits because his parents were Mexican. He said John McCain is not a war hero because he was captured. And he said African Americans are living in hell. Pence's response to Kane was, quote, if Donald Trump had said all the things you said in the way you said them, he wouldn't have a fraction of the insults Hillary Clinton has leveled, end quote. But Trump literally, literally said all of those things, and Pence didn't refute any of them. Did Pence defend Trump adequately? Ad adequately? And, Donnie, I'm going to throw this to you. Pence, how do you think he did? Um, so I kind of have to agree with a little bit with what you had said earlier. So um, I actually think that he did, he was very poised. Um, I'm not a fan of him personally, and I'm, I'm definitely not, not a fan of Trump, but when it comes to kind of judging how they acted, how they took upon the debate, I have to say that I do think he was a little bit more poised. I think that, again, the fact that his opponent was trying, was attacking him a little bit more than yeah. he was, I was expecting completely the opposite, complete. So yeah. I think that kind of threw me off a little bit, you know, that took me away from kind of um, going towards, you know, the, the Democratic yeah. side and kind of listening more to their policies instead of seeing 
how they acted, you know. So I think that that gave Pence a positive boot, you know. Um, when it comes to their policies, I don't agree with them at all, you know. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a Latina, you know, and they are very aggressive on attacking Latinas, um, Mexican specifically, I'm Mexican-American, um, and that's a huge issue that's going on in this debate, you know. Um, so, of course, I'm not for them, um, for that, that party, but the fact that they kept on going back and forth, they would talk about something else, and then they would go back yeah. to the whole Mexican issue. Yeah. So it's kind of like, I feel like they're trying to create more controversy mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. focusing on the issue when at the end of the day, like, we know your stand on it. Why do we have to keep on going to it? It's just it was, making, it was, I think reality, it's just making um, the Latino community be more mad to create more controversy, um, to create more protests, right. you know? Well, because, well so, Trump's whole thing, though, that's how he yeah. started his campaign, which is that, Mexicans that are coming here that Mexico is sending, which they aren't, they're all rapists and they're criminals and we should deport all of them. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's one of the many deplorable things he said, but that's literally the crux of his entire campaign is Mexicans are rapists, we're building the wall, it's going to be great. But, so. let, but let, let's get to a critique here that, yeah. that was made by Pence. He said, although he said those things, the way in which he said them was the main qualifying factor to them being illegitimate yeah. or wrong or immoral. Do you feel like that defense is an adequate no, defense for Trump? it doesn't because, first off, at many times during the debate, he said that Trump never even said those things, which is just completely untrue. And regardless of how he said it, he said them in a way that was offensive, and the core of those messages were offensive. John McCain's not a war hero. He got captured. Uh, you know, this woman this uh, Ezra Khan's wife wasn't allowed to speak. Why wasn't she allowed to speak? It's probably because she's a Muslim. Uh, oh man, Mexicans, Pence had his work yeah. cut out for him. Mexicans, with it. Mexicans are rapists. Like these Trump are the core messages. Trump did not make it easy for him. Exactly. Yeah. So, these are the core messages. Well, it so, so, so let, let me ask you then, Blake. One of the one of the main critiques for Pence was Pence did a lot for his own political portfolio, <laughs> but not a lot for Trump. Do you agree with that? I think that in him, like, kind of trying to bring the focus off of those comments, he maybe brought a little more attention to them, but. I really don't see a like a valid path for him to get around what Donald Trump is saying and and support it and still further their campaign. So I really think he was in between a rock and a hard place with that. And he did a very good job of just avoiding those topics and kind of um, moving the focus yeah. onto other things, right. which is what you really have to do when there's something that cannot well, be defended. Well, Lee, Lee, then I want to give you the last word on Mike or on uh, Mike Pence. Mm -hmm. What do you think? How did he do? It, it's an interesting situation in that. I don't know that he necessarily promoted his own campaign, but I, like you said, I really, I, I don't envy the work that he had cut out for him. No. Donald Trump has given more sound bites in this campaign for the sole purpose of isolating the Latino vote. And they did that to rally the conservative vote. Mm -hmm. And it's a Tea Party tactic that we saw in 12 and in 14 mm -hmm. sweep the country and really rally a lot of voters and get people active. So I can't... Mike Pence, there's nothing he's going to be able to say or do to discredit what Donald Trump had to say. The idea that we're only looking southerly for a wall, I still find appalling. Right. When 1,500 Canadians blew across a river and wound up in Michigan, how tight is our security when a river floating trip brings over 1,500 illegal immigrants at that point? These are illegal aliens. Well, well, all, 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 Quijano. There were continuous moments of crosstalk and moments when the nine topic goal seemed unreachable in the 90 minute time limit. Though True. some missteps occurred and candidates spoke over one another, how did Quijano do? Adani, I'm going to pass this to you. How do you think she did as a moderator? Um, so I think, I think honestly, she had to be a little bit a little bit more intense. Mm -hmm. She had to be a little bit more affirmative. She had to get in there. Um, I think her voice overall, she had a very, she had a very good voice. But I think you need a strong personality um, to be at at those kind of places at that time, especially in the polarized um, election that we're going through right now. So overall, I think she needed to be a little bit more aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, but let me just say that I do appreciate the fact that they put a woman and a minority woman as well. Yeah. Um, I think that that was amazing, and I think that we do have to appreciate well, yeah, that. Brandy. I actually think I'm a little more happy with her performance. I think. No matter who was there, it wasn't going to matter. They were going to argue back and forth. That's and I think true. she actually was very forceful at times. I mean, she kept interrupting when Pence would go on. She interrupted him when Kane was going on. She did that. So I actually really appreciate it. I understand that, you know, a moderator should be, as you say, more forceful, more shutting down, whatnot. But considering the situation, I was very proud of her. And I, I agree with the Latina woman comment. I think it's nice, you know, especially this whole campaign and these debates, you've seen people of color, uh, minorities like that, 
taking on these uh, positions as moderators. And granted, Lester Holt wasn't that great, but <laughs> it's nice to see diversity, especially in a campaign when you have two white people running. And well, a woman. Yeah. And a woman. That's an important thing to add a woman, but white people. Well, Blake, I'm going to give you the last <laughs> word on Elaine then. This is a woman who was a moderator. Do you feel like there was any sort of differential treatment given to her by these two candidates? Do you feel like that the reasons that they overspoke over her, over talked over her, or that they had crosstalk had anything to do with her gender? Uh, I don't think so. I think in a debate like this, uh, they're going to try to talk as much as they can, and we've seen it in the presidential debate and every debate before that. I would also just like to chime in and agree with everyone that it was really nice to see a person of color and a woman in a debate between two old white dudes, so that was pleasant. <laughs> um, and I think she did a decent job. I think that she was very like stringent with the questions and that mm -hmm. sometimes she would cut them off when there was good discourse going on, and sometimes she wouldn't interrupt when there was like a lot of nonsense being talked back and forth, but overall she did a really good job. I enjoyed watching. Well, let's go from the conflict on the debate stage to the conflict in the Middle East. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict has plagued the Middle East and the world for decades. The flashpoint for World War III in the West Bank has been settled, not by treaty, but by Israeli residents. The established communities, though legal in the eyes of the U.S., contain nearly 400,000 residents in contested territory in the eyes of most Palestinians. In the eyes of the international law, the Israeli settlements are considered wholly illegal in this holy territory. Tor territory. So is this settlement by the Israelis right, even though the international community tells them it's illegal? Lee, I want to throw this to you. Although this is considered illegal, it is considered illegal in the eyes of the United States, but it is contested territory. Should the Israelis be there? Should they be settling it? This is, I, I've got to preface by saying I was raised in a Jewish household and raised with um, kind of an, an Israeli superiority, and it's really an attitude of we are the chosen people, and there's a sense of entitlement that goes along with it. The, the preface or the premise that Israel was settled is still convoluted to this day. The idea that we can get involved in a conflict and we can get involved in a, a war in some capacity and then as a result of a war in Europe, we're going to just grant asylum on the most hotly contested plot of land that's ever existed throughout the course of recorded history just seems like a, a case of entitlement and privilege. I don't, it's not that I believe that misplaced Jews don't have somewhere to go or that they don't have a claim to the land, but the circumstances under which we got involved and settled the land for them really led to the situation that we're in right now. And we've done nothing since then but maintain uh, a friendship with Israel that the world has known about, and yet we've denied. We've known they had nukes, yet we denied right. they had nukes, and we just recently acknowledged that. So, well, well then, well then, Blake, I'm going to toss it over to you. This question between the Palestinians and the Israelis: Who's in the right here? Who's right. in the wrong? So first, we have to clear. Let's like clear everything up a little bit. Um, as far as the settlements go. The Israeli government proposed an expansion of a settlement in the West Bank. And now what's important about this is we got to get some geography going here. Uh, Palestine occupies uh, some territory, and that is going to be the Gaza Strip and the West Bank and East Jerusalem. The settlement that Israel is so, so uncalled um, expanding, they're really just building a new one, is in um, the West Bank. And what's important about this is that it will connect a string of the settlements that are on Palestinian land uh, and it will make the idea of a two-state solution to this problem nearly impossible because it will make the Palestinian land unviable. Now as far as being in the right and being in the wrong, I believe that Israel is responsible for some gross violations here as well as the rest of the world I believe agrees with that. Um, I think that they are basically occupying Palestine, which um, should be its own country, but instead Israel continues to expand into it and put restrictions on it and make it extremely difficult for Palestine to gain its own sovereignty. And that's the part I have yep. the, the biggest issue with there, is the restrictions they place on citizens, because it reminds me a lot of the civil rights era that we saw here in America. Even after slavery was ended in 1800, we still had another hundred years where people could, could go here, could use this water fountain, couldn't use that water sense. fountain. Exactly, exactly my point. Thank Can you. I actually add yeah, a point? Yeah, go ahead. I am also of um, Jewish descent. My grandparents were ethnically Jewish, so I have, a, I have a stake in this too. And I agree with you. I don't really think what the Israelis are doing is, is great. This is other people's land. And it's, it is because of the chosen mentality. We are the chosen people of God. This is our land, blah, blah, blah. And... <clears throat> Considering their history to have been nomads and being displaced people and everything, I think it was a good idea in theory to give them a land. But first of all, putting it in the middle of the Middle East, not a great idea. And then on top of that, they essentially did to the Palestinian people what the world had done to them. Make them 
landless people, separate them from the world, treat them appallingly, and it 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 really gets rid of any sort of moral high ground that Israel has. And I think going off the first question, the United States is completely wrong in supporting this, as it has been with actually, many of its policies. Actually, um, <laughs> the United States right. actually recently uh, just came out with a statement in regards to the newest settlement, and the U.S. used very, very strong language against Israel, which is on the heels of them having this huge multi-billion dollar defense deal. Uh, so the U.S. is done with their honeymoon with Israel and Thank is God. back on tense terms because Good. the U.S. said that they strongly condemned the new settlement plan. Strongly condemned is language that foreign policy leaders in our country use to describe terrorist attacks and things like that. So the United States is not on board with Israelis' expansion ideas into Palestine. Additionally, um, the Netanyahu, the prime minister, had said publicly in 2009 that there weren't going to be any more expansions. So on the heels of this deal with the United States, we find it very disturbing that Israel would decide to expand and go back on their word right after we had made this deal. Well, well, I would say that's well, comforting to hear, actually. Yeah. Well, from that, let's go on from the melting pot of the West Bank to just pot. <laughs> <laughs> On this year's ballot, marijuana legalization is up for vote. The law would allow adults to possess, consume, and cultivate some, some marijuana for recreational purposes. The law would create a 15% excise tax, with that revenue going to Nevada schools. The law has been argued to eliminate a significant part of drug trade in underground markets, boost Nevada's tourism sector, and create thousands of jobs. Although this looks good on paper, are the benefits actually within reach? Adanya, I'm going to pass this off to you. Marijuana legalization in Nevada, for it or against it? Um, so when you say for or against something, I think it's important to kind of state that there are pros and cons to every issue. You know, sure, so when you absolutely. say pro, I, to me personally, I'm not pro in every single thing, mm -hmm. but I do think that it will benefit and it has a lot of good benefits. Um, recently, the Review Journal came out with a really good investigation where they got a reporter, they took the reporter all the way to go to Colorado and kind of compare um, everything that has been going on with Colorado and their legalization of re recreational marijuana and how that would benefit or harm Nevada. Um, so I came up with a lot of really good facts and I think something that's very important um, to state is that I do think that it will bring um, really good money to the, to the to the state overall um, but it does have some harms you know so for example um, the number of DUIs grew that's mm -hmm. something that we really need to talk about. Um, and that's something that is very bad. And the, the number of pedestrians um, dying grew as well. So right. that's something that we need to talk about as well. But overall, I think that it has a lot of good benefits. Mm -hmm. I think that um, looking as marijuana as a gateway drug, I think it needs to be looked at differently. And that's something yeah. that I know you as right. a psychologist and, 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 and Brendan, about. Brendan, yeah, I want you to respond really to this. Good yes. So I, um, <laughs> if any of this on there, I have actually used drugs. Okay. And I find it, It's that on now, it's on there forever. Just I know. You know. Yeah. Tell us yeah. all about No, mm -hmm. um, I have smoked marijuana. Uh, I find that whole argument that marijuana is a gateway drug is, is such crap, it really is. You wanna know what a gateway drug is? Sm cigarettes. I was around cigarette smoking in my whole life. My grandfather and father were active cigarette smokers. Uh, I started smoking when I was 17. I've been on and off now for like seven years. So that to me was the gateway drug. Had I never smoked, none of that would have happened. You well, wanna really talk about a gateway drug, that's it. And then going off that too, I don't think what the American electorate understands is that people are gonna use drugs regardless of whether you make them legal or illegal. I say exactly. look to Portugal. They decriminalized all drugs across the board 14 years ago. And the drug use in the country dropped. I mean, uh, marijuana use for kids 16 to 18 dropped from 2.6 to 1.8%. Uh, the number of deaths by age, which was a big correlation uh, with the drugs, uh, got cut in half. Uh, and although that's a good case study, population yeah. size should play a factor uh, Absolutely. In no, I'm right. not saying that's a direct and, but, comparison. But, but, but one of the things I'm going to press you on here yeah. is that there's also been considered that this law would also increase uh, the amount of emergency room visits, calls into poison control. It would also increase, as Adanya pointed out, uh, yeah. you know, under the influence drivers. Yes. Do you consider this something that is an obstacle in the way of marijuana to such a point that it would uh, disallow the law altogether, no. or do you find this I would not because right? if again we look at say something like alcohol, which is already legal, you already see similar exactly. statistics there. Uh, people driving under the influence, deaths by um, people driving under the influence of uh, people, alcohol poisoning, and again yeah. for marijuana, I mean most studies have you know we're not 
We haven't had a lot of long-term studies studying the effect, but they're nowhere near as harmful as cigarettes or alcohol. Right. I think you know what, it's I a different thing in itself. Lee, I, I, Lee, I yeah. want to give you a, yeah. a chance here to Yeah, talk. I think what's important to look at is the legislation that is against specifically. Mm -hmm. It's treating marijuana like alcohol. Absolutely. I think that is huge in how we move forward. I'm of the mindset that while I, I'm a medical marijuana consumer, I have my card here in Nevada, I have one in Arizona, I have one in California just so I can travel. God bless you. <laughs> I'm a proponent of marijuana. If they were to tell me tomorrow that we're going to outlaw marijuana and alcohol and nicotine and caffeine, okay, good. Then let's do this for the right it's reasons across agree. the board. Right. But just isolating marijuana exactly. is the part that I find despicable. And I'll tell you something else that we've seen. Right. I was reading an, an article in the Times from Sunday. And they said that the heroin epidemic can be specifically attrib attributed to the legalization of marijuana because now that we're growing marijuana here and we're able to get it for cheaper, mm -hmm. the Mexican cartels have had to focus their attention on supplying a different drug to us to supplement the lost revenue from the marijuana streams well, that they're well, losing. Well, that was going to well, happen Well, Lee, Lee, so, Lee, Lee, I, 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 I'm going to give Blake the last word here real quick. Weed. Give us the quick summary of what you think of weed last word. All right. I'm not an avid weed smoker, but I do think it should be legal in Nevada. We were the divorce state. Contentious stuff has been Nevada's issue. <laughs> so I'll give you a couple reasons why I Real think quickly. that weed is should be legalized. Money, we can tax it. Mm -hmm. We can regulate it. We can get the money out of the hands of criminals. And lastly, especially for Southern Nevada, uh, tourism. N Colorado's uh, tourism office showed that weed was responsible for boosting up their tourism and increasing their revenue by $2.6 billion. So well, and, 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 you know, we would hope that with laws like this, if they are preceded with good benefits and the good of all people, we hope they would pop up like weeds. <laughs> That's our time. I want to thank our panelists and you for watching our show and let you know while all the other shows just like to ramble, we'll be right here for you on The Scramble. Thank you and see you again.